Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for you to join us this morning. Uh, my name is Scott Walker. I am part of a member of the revised class one vehicle access regime program uh, at TMR and I'll be your MC for today. Um, so we will get started with the, the normal affairs. Thank you. Sandy. Thank you. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we meet today. Uh, I'd also like to pass my respects to both elders uh, past and present. Also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are online with us today. We'll now run through a uh, short video to show you TMR's story. Queensland, home to more than 5 million of you, connecting you from A to B by more than 33,000 kilometres of state-controlled road, 6,600 kilometres of rail track and 124 million public transport trips each year. Our job, no, our passion is to deliver a network that is accessible to everyone at every age or stage. We're investing more than $6 billion to improve our transport infrastructure, making your roads more flood resilient and bringing new ways to pay so you can use our network your way. We're making your health and safety our top priority. We're always listening to you, creating more online services than ever, serving customers online over 12 million times each year. We've kept the state moving, transporting more than 1 billion tonnes of freight, adding more than 23 kilometres of new cycling infrastructure and building and upgrading new boating infrastructure too. We're investing more than 1 billion to maintain and improve our network operations. We're recycling 1.5 million tyres and using them to build our roads. We're switching more than 35,000 streetlights to smart LED technology. We're creating a transport system that's environmentally friendly and socially sustainable. Investing in skills, creating jobs and embracing new technology. Queensland, we're here for you to connect you to family and friends, work, schools and hospitals. To create a single transport network accessible to everyone. So um, today in our webinar, uh, we will be taking you through uh, the heavy vehicle, uh, the national law reforms, the national developments in the access reforms, uh, the, our key partner perspectives on those access, access reforms, why we're focusing on class one vehicles in Queensland, um, our proposed new access regime, and how the new access regime will work. And we'll finish up with some next steps and how you can provide some feedback. Just a little bit of housekeeping for everyone this morning. You may have noticed that mics, cameras and chat um, have been disabled. Uh, we have quite a lot of people online today um, and well into the hundreds of people online. So we just wanna make sure that the performance stays as it needs to, so you can have a, um, a good viewing experience of the webinar. We do have the Q&A function that is uh, enabled and we have our program team members ready to take questions. And you can access that by the, uh, the Q&A icon at the top of your team screen. Just click on that and put a question through and our team will be checking those and providing answers where they can. We will also pause throughout the webinar um, where we have time to grab some questions and put them to the presenters to answer. So we will get started um, straight into it for everyone and move on to the next piece of work. So firstly, we will start with Sally Todd, who is the Assistant Secretary of Land Transport Policy, the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, Communication and the Arts. Uh, Sally will set the scene with an overview of the National Automated Access System that is being proposed as a package of uh, heavy vehicle national law reforms to boost uh, safety and productivity. So I will now pass over to Sally. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today um, to talk about the National Automated Access System. 
So what is the NAS? So ministers, transport ministers have agreed that there will be a national automated access system. The aim here is to greatly reduce the number of access permits, which are taking up a lot of heavy vehicle operator time and a lot of government time. This national system for quicker decision making will have a number of other benefits as well. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so when will industry start to see automated, automated access roll out? So the NAS will be based on the Tasmanian Heavy Vehicle Access Management Systems, or HVAMs. HVAMs is operating successfully in Tasmania and version three is being progressively released, uh, uh, version three is being released progressively in Tasmania, New South Wales and Queensland this year. Okay, next slide. The aim is to provide a single seamless user experience. In addition to HFAMS 3 project, there are others involved in preparing for the NAS, such as Austro and the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. The Australian Government is supporting the alignment of these work streams towards the NAS through, de through a dedicated oversight committee. And I believe that brings me to the end of my short slides. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Greatly appreciated. So what is uh, HVAMS exactly? Well, HVAMS is not new. Um, it's a, it is a proven online access system that's been in operation in Tasmania since 2016. So hopefully we can hand over to uh, Aaron Percy and Luke Payne from the Department of Transport, uh, sorry, Department of State Growth, who have been best placed to be able to give us a demonstration of HVAMs. So hopefully this works and we can get Tasmania to now share HVAMs with us. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, mate. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Aaron Percy. Um, I'm engineering lead on the HVAMs development project. Been working on this project for 10 years. And as was just mentioned, uh, we're working on our third version of the system. Today we'll be presenting to you the second version of our system and the work that's underway on the third version. The second version of the system um, is about SPVs, special, special purpose vehicles in Tasmania, and that's been operating for five years in August this year. We'll be using that to demonstrate a few of the HVAMS principles, which carry through to the next version that we're currently working on. So it's free to use. Uh, networks are available to anybody who's interested, from vehicle designers, consigners, operators, and regulators. HVAMS presents a network, not individual, per not individual uh, routes, and that allows operators to as we'll demonstrate, find a way to get from A to B. Um, we recognise that there's one road network. Whilst there are multiple road managers, uh, any individual task might require two, three, four, five different road manager consents. So HVAMS provides transparency. It shows where the constraints are and then how to navigate around them. Importantly, HVAMS is available under notice. Access is granted under notice and it's available 24-7. It allows real-time planning. So I'm going to hand over to Luke now um, to give us a demonstration of HVAMS 2 and the work that's been, the system that's been operational for nearly five years. And then I'll talk about uh, the work we're currently um, doing now in the current project. Are the people able to allow Luke to present from his computer, computer please? Working on it now for you, mate. Right? 
That's you. Okay, Luke is now set as a presenter, so he should be able to share his screen. Fortunately, we were sitting next to each other, so I could just swap seats. OK, so as Aaron said, this is HVM's version two, um, which was released in Tasmania in 2019 for special, special purpose vehicles. Um, HVM's provides the whole network um, for the vehicle, and it's a bespoke network as well. So what we need to know are the specifics of your vehicle so that we can do the assessment and then provide the answer to you instantaneously under notice. So as an operator, I'd come to the website. Um, first time through, we need to get the vehicle details. Um, there's quite a lot of information that we need, um, but that's... Oh, am I? apparently not sharing the screen. OK. Bear with me. That looks better. There we go. Apologies for that. OK. Um, so yes, here's the website um, publicly available, as we said. First of all, we need to know the details about the vehicle. Um, it's quite a bit of information we need to be able to provide that bespoke network. Um, so we step the user through in a, a simple way. So first of all, tell us what you are. Let's say an all-terrain vehicle. We need to know the number of axles. Five, do you have a boom dolly? Yes or no? And my axles are distributed this way. Now, what this does is it allows us to get into the specifics um, for that particular vehicle. So we need the length, the width, height, some various questions around telematics, um, bear travel mode I'll come back to, and then into the nuts and bolts, we've got the, the axle details. So what are your spacings, your masses, ground contact widths, that type of thing. Now, first time through, you can obviously come in and enter um, the details in here. There's validation built into the page, which Aaron will talk to um, with the new version that we've got, um, which just aims to guide you through it. I won't put you through it all now. Um, once you've been through once, we present you with a vehicle code and the vehicle code um, is a shortcut through so that next time you don't have to enter all of the same details again. So I'll put a vehicle code in here. In this case, we've got a five axle all-terrain crane, uh, 14 metres long, 2.8, um, and we've got varying masses uh, from 8.9 through to 10. Um, so we'll check the inputs there just to make sure they're still valid, which they are. There's an acknowledgement here, um, basically that you've entered the, the um, data correct as your vehicle actually is. Um, and that takes us through to the map and straight away there you are there's your access for that vehicle around the whole network within tasmania now there's a fair bit going on here so i'll, I'll step you through some of the the key aspects um, we've got the roads um, which as you zoom in more and more become available And the colour of the road indicates the pilot and escort requirements um, for that particular vehicle. Um, the dots that you can see on the map are the structures 
So there's some structures like the one over here where there's uh, no additional access requirements. And then there's others like this one here that we need to put um, a, an access condition on, which in this case is um, travel in the center of the lane and no other heavy vehicles uh, at the time of travel. Um, some structures like this one up here, we can't actually get you across. The vehicle is just too big and that's a red dot, so no access on structure. But as you can see, because we present the whole network, you can see very quickly that there are alternate ways that you could get to the job. So if you had your yard over here somewhere, then you can start to do your real time planning there and then to see that rather than going up through Trevallon here, I could go down through Riverside and come um, along this way here. So primarily um, there's the structures are the choke points on the network, but importantly, there are other policy decisions made by road managers as well. So you can see here within uh, this particular council, there's certain roads that they've made the decision to turn off. Um, so HVAMS provides the mechanism to get those types of decisions um, from the road managers out to the um, to the operators or the users of the system. Now, I'm just going to touch on another couple of um, bits of functionality here. So we've got um, other advisory layers within the map as well. Now, this is all aimed to give you the information that you need to plan your trip around the network. So you can see the purple lines and the purple dots. These are the load limited roads and structures. Um, I can equally come in and turn on uh, structure clearances and um, state growth roadworks as well. Um, so for those of you in Queensland um, that are familiar with the um, conditions of operation database, um, many of these aspects are covered in there. HFAMS provides us with a mechanism to present that information to you and spatially as well. And it's subtle, but you might see over in the key over here that we're only actually showing um, load limits that are less than 49.2, which is the mass of that vehicle and structure clearances less than 3.5. Now, if I, which I'll do in a minute, we'll come back in with a different vehicle with different heights, then you'll be presented with different information. So the, the map that you see is specific to your vehicle. We don't show you things that are not uh, relevant to you for planning your trip. So I'll just jump back quickly. Um, and put in another code just to show that um, two, and I'll just put the height up to 4.5. Go to the advisory. So you can see now we've got clearances up to 4.5 and all of a sudden there's um, some clearances that are of concern around the state. Another important bit of functionality that we've got, um, there's obviously a lot of information here um, uh, for you to get your head around. So we've introduced this route planner and the route planner allows you, it provides a summary of um, conditions that occur along a route. So let's assume that I've got a yard over here in Prospect and I've got a job that is up here on Bridge North Road. Now, pretty quickly, you can see the most direct route. There's several structures here that we're not able to cross um, because there's a no access condition. I can see that there may be an alternate route coming down here, um, but again, there's a structure uh, of concern here. There is actually another route up the top here um, and what I can do is add in a stop and change the order. And you can quickly see coming through here, this structure is actually an overpass. Um, and there is an alternate way that we could go with this. Now I've got the route card functionality here. The route card summarizes what occurs along that particular route. 
Um, so it goes away and interrogates the system to get any conditions of travel along there. And if I jump back after a little while, it gives you your turn by turn um, instructions of how to get there. And you can see in this case, there's one structure where we've got a slowdown condition, but we can make our way to the job. Now, it may be that 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 obviously provides a fair bit of extra length and obviously time to get to the job. So there's other ways that we can quickly figure out a way to um, get there. Um, it may be that we can go back in and actually change the load on the vehicle. So if I jump back across, we can modify our parameters. Now, the bare travel mode here, um, what this is, is if we, if you as an operator tell us that you can remove any excess weight off your vehicle whatsoever, then we will do our best to try and um, get you across the network. So in this case, um, I've removed some counterweights, removed the flying jib, and I will reduce the masses on all axles by a tonne. Keep in mind that what I'm doing here, this is exactly what you could be doing as an operator whilst on phone, on the phone to a client to plan out how to get from A to B through your job. So now if we go back to the, the route trace here and we go from the yard back out to the job. And again, we've got those three structures here. But as you can see, we can now get along the network um, and head out this way, which is shorter than having to go out through um, through the city to get there. I could confirm via route card um, to then produce the instructions along that route as well. You can also change the actual vehicle as well. So rather than um, reducing the mass, it may be you want to take your counterweights. Um, maybe for this particular job, it makes sense to use a dolly to carry the boom. Um, and again, I've got a vehicle code here for that vehicle with a dolly. Lost over that. Check our inputs. Through to the map. And there you go, straight away we have a new network specific to this vehicle and as you can see there are um, fewer conditions on the network because the, the mass is distributed out across the vehicle. Now in this case the roads have gone blue. Um, jump over to the key. Condition of travel set by the, um, by the road managers is that for this particular vehicle on the blue roads, you have to take a pilot vehicle with you uh, as a safety mitigation type thing. The last bit of functionality I just want to touch on, you've got day and night travel. Um, now, in this particular case, um, the mitigation uh, on the roads um, doesn't actually change for this uh, vehicle with the dolly. Um, just very quickly jump back to the... Um, other vehicle that we had. When we get through to. Through to the map. Um, toggle over here and you can see the roads change colour from day to night. Now that, that basically is a decision that we've made as road managers and if you're travelling at night because of the size of the vehicle, we request that you take additional pilot and escort vehicles. I'll hand over to Aaron now and he'll go through some of the work we've done on HVMS3.
Okay, thanks, Luke. So Luke was flying around there. Um, there's a fair bit we want to show you in, in 15 minutes. So I've got a couple of minutes left to explain to you where we're at with the current development. Um, but SPV operators in, in Tasmania have been enjoying that system um, for quite a few years now. Um, and we want to expand that from SPV out to ultimately um, all heavy vehicles. And in Tasmania, the next um, group of operators that we're lo looking at supporting are PBS operators. So we get started. We choose the state we're operating in. We choose the vehicle category and the vehicle type. And so it might be a, a livestock A double. We can then assemble the vehicle. So I might be a try, random try, a double. And in the same way Luke described, you are then presented with a number of, of questions to answer. Um, for this screen, we've got vehicle eligibility. So we're just confirming that the vehicle is within the range that the system is currently providing. So above 26 and up to 36 and a half. It's a PBS vehicle, um, that the vehicle's enrolled in the telematics scheme in Tasmania and has smart onboard mass and NHVS. I'll just skip over. I won't have time to discuss any of that in detail today. And then we've now got a screen that allows us to enter the vehicle details and the vehicle parameters for that vehicle that we've selected. So for PBS, we, we want the PBS performance results. So the road manager can assess the network against uh, the performance results of the vehicle. So that includes low speed swept paths so we can look at intersections, which intersection moves movements are allowed um, based on the low speed swept path. Um, we've got tracking ability on a straight path, grade ability and start ability. So we can start to make assessments on the network and switch parts of the network red, for example, that might have a steep grade, but not present that to all vehicles, only those vehicles that don't meet that performance result. In the same way, once you've entered that data once, you don't have to do it again. So I'm going to go back to the start and enter a vehicle code. And we're then taken to the summary page and here are all the vehicle parameters that has been, have been entered with a vehicle code. And then we, we go through to the map. So to, to get through to the map, that's available to this network is very quick once the data has been entered for the first time. Also, as uh, the network is updated, so as a vehicle is strengthened or it has a road, sorry, as a, a bridge is strengthened or a, um, an intersection is upgraded or a bridge is upgraded, we update that data. The road manager signs off on the new data in the system and it's immediately available next time uh, an operator refreshes the map. So for this particular vehicle on this network, uh, an operator might have a, a job um, from Carrick through to Bernie. Um, and you can see that there are some restrictions there along that route. So what the what you can simply do from the map is to adjust uh, using this tool called modify mass and reconfirm the new masses. And you can see those restrictions have removed, been removed. And so very quickly, uh, you can adjust the mask accordingly and get access to where you need to go. And then this uh, screen confirms what the adjusted masses are. I don't have time today to talk about, um, about how that's happening, um, but I just wanted to illustrate that the system allows you to find a way um, to, to do the job. Okay, I'm now gonna just jump away from PBS into uh, platforms. Uh, I know there's a lot of people in the audience today that are interested in, in um, access for platforms in Queensland. And so it's very similar. Um, you just move through and select your vehicle type. In this case, we've got a prime mover and a platform trailer. You just choose the number of axles in the platform. And then you would head through. This is the vehicle eligibility screen we looked at. It, there's some slightly different questions for 
Uh, for platforms in Queensland, these are set by the road manager. What are the requirements that the road manager is placing on an operator who wants to use his system? Um, and here we've got some telematics questions. Um, and so you would answer those questions um, and then you would, you would head through the map in the same way. So that's the end of the, the demonstration today. Um, there's a lot more detail we, we'd love to go uh, in at a future time. But in summary, um, the system supports road managers um, to, to make their road manager decision. It supports industry uh, to get their, their consent quickly. Uh, and it gives lots of options for operators to navigate around the network. I'll hand back over to Scott. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aaron, and thank you, Luke. Um, it is a, an amazing system that will definitely transform um, how we how we view and get access on the mainland. And there is a, a lot of significant benefits for industry and the road managers like inside that system. So now we'll move on and we will hear from uh, Tasmania, New South Wales and Queensland on how they're progressing with HVAMS version 3. Firstly, I would like to pass on to uh, Elspeth Moroni, and please hope I have said that correctly, um, the Director of Network Management um, in the Infrastructure Tasmania Division. So Elspeth, it's yours. Thanks, Scott, and also thanks to Luke and Aaron, who are a key part of our um, heavy vehicle network access team in Tassie, who are busy developing our next version of HFAM for ourselves, as well as supporting Queensland and New South Wales. So um, as you're sort of aware in TAS, we've been working closely with industry and all our road managers to deliver HFAMS 1 um, for our OSOM with where we've had an 80% permit reduction since 2016, and HVAMS 2 for our SPVs, um, which has a 95% reduction in permits um, since 2019. So, and now, um, as Aaron and Luke have said, you know, our focus is really on delivering HVAMS 3. Um, that really involves rebuilding our back end architecture to expand to scale beyond TAS. Um, and based on our past successes, and with a focus also on certain PBS freight vehicles for Tassie, as well as the initial releases for Queensland and New South Wales. And you'll learn more about where Queensland's at in this webinar. So just onto our next slide. So what success for us? Um, we've had consultants, including Houston Kemp and WSP, assessing what we do and recommending and noting our success to date, which is great. For us, this success has been achieved for us as the Department of State Growth, as our Category 1 and State Road Manager, making timely decisions and requiring less permits. Um, highlighting a single road network for industry, regardless of road um, networks and asset ownerships across Tasmania, incorporating our 29 local government areas. Providing certainty and consistency for our road access decisions with a key focus on providing an accessible road network rather than one off routes. And then also the, um, by doing allowing anyone to do network access planning. So thanks for your interest in what we're up to in Tassie and we'll, we'll quietly keep doing what we do. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to New South Wales. Thanks, Elspeth. We'll pass over now to Scott Greeno, the Acting Executive Director for Freight at Transport for New South Wales. So, thanks, Scott and Elspeth. Uh, morning, everybody. I, I won't read out my slide, but as you can see, even from that very short demonstration from Tasmania, the automated access is clearly the future and the best way from a customer experience and also from a road manager point of view. So New South Wales is working with Tasmania and Queensland to be ready as quickly as possible to be able to adopt the system as soon as it uh, comes online. 
Uh, of course, there is work that needs to be done for that. So there's a whole range of steps behind the scenes to uh, have the data plugged in and ready to go into the the system as it's available. But also some of that data doesn't necessarily exist in a compiled fashion at the moment. So we're working with councils to be able to try and collect that data uh, to make sure the system can work across as much of the New South Wales state road, uh, state as much as the New South Wales road network as possible, not just the state road network. So that will take some time to roll out. Uh, one thing I would call out there on my slide, the second last point there, machine learning cameras, you may have seen some of those. If you're um, moving through New South Wales, they look like dialects on the side of the road. Uh, they're collecting data about how vehicles move across the network. All of that data will inform our information, our ability to make decisions on uh, access in the future and maintenance and investment strategy. So you can see how this all feeds together to be able to get better customer outcomes and better road manager outcomes as well. Thanks, Scott. I'm happy to hand over or back to you. Excellent. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, we'll now hear from uh, Dennis Walsh, the Chief Engineer of the Engineering and Technology Branch here at Queensland's Department of Transport and Main Roads. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And um, we're in a pretty similar situation to New South Wales that um, Scott just described. Uh, so we've certainly been on uh, the benefits of HVAMs and how we see that as being a centrepiece for the NAS going forward. And that's consistent with the Transport Minister's decision last year to base the NAS on HVAMs. Uh, we work, we've got a working group with industry. And we've had that in place for, for some time. And we went through a due diligence process to look at the available systems that are in place around the country or in under development. And HVAMs was assessed as meeting our needs and also best meeting the needs of industry as well. Hopefully a demonstration from Aaron and Luke um, the audience today can see um, just what a leap forward Tasmania have made, and we'd like to bring that to mainland Australia as well. Um, so we've been working with other road managers, um, local governments, um, the port roads um, to bring data into HVAMS version three. We're going to do this progressively. 80% of our OSM movements, as you'd appreciate, occur on about 10% of council roads. So we'll be focusing in on those councils, those 10% in the initial stages. And similar to what Scott described, we've got IT interfaces to pipe our road, um, bridge, access conditions, road dimensional data, and structural assessments into HVAMs. So we have all that data uh, currently in our organisation. The trick now for us is to be able to pipe that into HVAMs 3. So we've got a project of our own working in concert with Tasmania on how to make that happen. Um, if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so we plan um, access under a dynamic HVAMS notice to substantially reduce the number of permits as being um, and that will really, um, for us, focus initially on the class one low loaders and um, load platforms. Um, the special purpose vehicles, including mobile cranes and defence vehicles, will come later and after that um, in a subsequent stage. Eventually, we envisage all heavy vehicles operating under a, uh, even under static notices with their routes displayed on the NHVR network maps to eventually be covered by the HVM system as well. We'll provide a lot more detail on this later in the presentation. So I'll hand you back to Scott at this point. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, our key partners around the, the, the key benefits their members are currently experiencing uh, in using uh, HVAMs in Tasmania and the benefits that they see when this is rolled out on the mainland. So we will start with uh, Sanjib uh, Sathai, the Director of Transport and Infrastructure Policy at the Australian Local Government Association. Thank you, Sanjib. Thanks, Scott. So um, as you can see, HVAMS has been running extremely successfully in Tasmania for a number of years now. We've got 29 out of 29 councils are on board with it down there, which says a lot to uh, what Tasmania has been able to achieve down there with uh, with the system. And we really do back its uh, implementation across the country. Um, so you know, from, a, from a council perspective, we're in the un unenviable position of managing extensive lengths of road network with limited funding and resources. 
Uh, but this is set to improve uh, thanks directly to ALGA's advocacy as part of the government's review of its 10 year infrastructure investment pipeline, which will see the doubling of roads recovery funding from 500 million to 1 billion by 2027. Uh, this will take the council's slice of the $120 billion pipeline from $5 billion to uh, over 10 years to $10 billion. So while this historic funding increase is obviously most welcome and we'll see council roads better maintained, it does not, however, account for the billions of dollars of road and road-related infrastructure in poor condition that is needed replacing, as was highlighted by the recent, the recent Grattan Institute report, meaning more advocacy work needs to be done um, by all concerned, preferably. Now, when it comes to HVMs, you know, if all roads were gold plated, we wouldn't be here today talking about this system. But because they're not, the ALGA board unanimously endorsed the National Automated Access System based on HVMs 3 for council road managers, as it will provide the long call for access certainty sought by industry while helping to ensure that freight movements remain safe and sustainable while allowing us to get the most productivity of our network in its current state. So from a council perspective, HVAMS offers you know, the following benefits by automating access. As you've seen, it can uh, substantially reduce the number of manual permits that need to be processed. So for councils, it will mean a dramatic reduction in the administrative burden that this uh, takes, you know, that this places on them. Two to three hours per permit uh, is about average. So that uh, that will allow councils to focus on other things that are you know that are uh, particularly important around their network in terms of managing access and uh, maintenance and other things instead of having to process permits. It'll support councils better understand the capacity of their networks to sustainably support movement um, because they'll get data and, and infrastructure assessments as part of this rollout. And, it, and this will also help modernise council asset management practices as they'll be able to digitise them as part of this process. At the same time, councils will be able to uh, maintain uh, their ability to manage freight movement across their networks as they always have. Next slide, please. So we have talked about um, the introduction of telematics as a part of HBM as, as a condition of access, and we're not interested in it from a um, policing perspective. It's purely about having visibility of what type of freight is moving where and when across council networks. And this is critical because it'll help council shift from a scheduled maintenance approach, which is currently in place, to a predictive maintenance approach, which is much more sophisticated and targeted. And it'll provide councils with the data they need to support road funding advocacy in the short to medium term. So you know, if if industry wants, you know, main, levels of service maintained and or improved, this is the way forward. And ultimately, the end game for us is that it'll help councils move from a grants based road funding model, which is very sort of scattergun at the moment, to a much more sustainable targeted model that is driven by data rather than random grants applications. So there's a lot of benefits that um, come out of the imp implementation of this system and approach that uh, goes beyond just the immediate access question at hand. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, and we will now hear from Damien Hentz, who is the Road Policy Advisor at the Crane Industry Council of Australia. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you everyone for the opportunity uh, to be here today to, uh, to talk about the benefits of HVAMs. Um, as I said, my name is Damien Hentz. I work for the Crane Industry Council of Australia. Uh, we've been partnering with uh, the various road agencies and certainly DSG uh, quite strongly in the development and delivery of, of the HVAM system. Our members in uh, Tasmania are very happy with the system. Um, basically, we, we get instantaneous and certain access uh, for crane owners, which is something that's very different to what we're getting currently through the 28-day portal processing system. Uh, that doesn't work for the lifting industry. We need to be far more responsive than that to our customers. So uh, the portal process is very challenging, uh, obviously, and often uh, ends in compliance and enforcement type activities uh, where we'd prefer things to be quite simple, instantaneous and transparent. Uh, so just wanted to acknowledge the, the HVAMS team in Tasmania. They've been fantastic to work with. And from industry's perspective, um, I guess I'm communicating to some of the operators uh, in the in the call. Um, the partnership approach has been critical to delivering a lot of these benefits. And uh, I think we're in a in a pretty good spot when it comes to that kind of thing. 
One of the main benefits of HVAMs is the opportunity to, uh, I guess, have some flexibility. So we can run different configurations and you saw some of that functionality delivered earlier in the demonstration. Uh, that allows crane owners to put counterweight on, take counterweight off or reconfigure the vehicle to, to get to the job. It also provides more flexibility in terms of our ability to, I guess, configure vehicles in the yard before they get to the job. Um, often we get to jobs and then have to reconfigure vehicles under the current system. So uh, there's some significant benefits there. When it comes to telematics, Sanjeev just sort of referred to, to the concept of telematics. Uh, our industry is in the point of realising that sharing data is actually the best way to go, um, having transparency for road managers and, and industry about where we're going um, obviously provides better data to make decisions upon about asset management. So from our perspective, the sharing of the data is, is important, uh, but in return, we get clear alternate routes uh, and we get the ability to then go and price jobs properly um, cost them properly and then obviously pass those costs on accurately to our customers uh, from that perspective. The other thing that's really critical that um, that both Tasmania and, and Sanjeev pointed out is the uh, the end-to-end -end solution. So in the incorporation of local government from the start and the end of the journey, uh, a lot of you would have heard of the concept of last mile and all of that kind of thing. Uh, HVAMs has solved that and it's, uh, it's a fantastic and, and very welcome development. Can I get the next slide please, Scott? Um, the other thing is, is obviously the ability when we're talking about certain um, and instantaneous access to respond to emergencies, to changes in, in jobs, in time critical lifts, etc. So again, that operational flexibility is incredibly important and I'd wanted to, uh, I guess, emphasise that. In terms of compliance and enforcement, you saw the uh, the root card functionality that facilitates turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Again, under permit systems currently, that doesn't exist. So operators can make mistakes, they can turn the wrong way, we can you know, end up in, in compliance and enforcement act, you know, spaces uh, from people making mistakes. And again, the, the HVAM system uh, makes it a lot easier for, for our crane drivers on the road every day. The other thing that's probably not such an obvious benefit, but is a fantastic benefit, is the transparency in the vehicle processing, or the, sorry, the vehicle purchasing process. So when a, a crane owner is looking to buy a crane, they can enter all the different types of vehicles that they're looking at and see the kind of access they'll get in their local areas. So again, it takes away a bit of the mystery of buying a new vehicle and wondering where it can go. There is no mystery anymore because HVAMS is very clear and tells you where you, you can run that vehicle. So you have a bit more confidence uh, in the purchasing process. The other thing as well is that obviously the manufacturers become aware of the kinds of vehicles that people are preferring um, and then might think about changes to design processes. So again, very interesting kind of development that is, I guess, a side benefit. The other thing, of course, is the administrative savings. We're not sitting around waiting for permits. We're not paying for permits. We're not waiting for responses or for additional information, et cetera. Um, so again, a, a really positive experience from, from that perspective. Uh, and the ability to plan for the future. So again, looking to, to move yards or set up somewhere differently, you'd be able to have a map, um, have a look at where the vehicles can and can't go and be able to plan from, from that perspective. Um, interestingly, um, SICA uh, has had the opportunity to sort of connect some of the key road managers in this call, so TMR, Transport for New South Wales and DSG, um, to, to the European, I guess, side of things when it comes to road access, because cranes, you know, have issues with access all over the world. Um, and it's become quite clear that the European Commission, and more specifically, a, a group called DG Move uh, within that commission are very interested in HVAMs. Uh, we've had DSG um, presenting to them, and there's very, very strong interest uh, from, from, from their perspective. The other thing is the European Transport Association, or ESTA, um, is also very interested, and we've been facilitating multiple discussions with them about the benefits of HVAMs. So uh, at this stage, I can hand back to you, Scott, and uh, we can continue on. Excellent. Thanks, Damien. So we're just going to uh, push along quite quickly now because we're going to try and make up some time. So we've now heard from the Australian government on the national direction um, around the national automated access system being based on HVAMs. And we've heard from uh, the three states outline their implementation plans for HVAMs version three. Additionally, we've heard from ALGA and just then SICA on the key benefits that they're currently experiencing in Tasmania and the benefits that we will see when this is rolled out in the mainland. So I'll now pass straight on to uh, to Dennis, who will take us through some more detail about Queensland's direction and our new heavy vehicle access regime. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And um, before I uh, move on to that, I might just summarise um, what I've heard from the various presenters this morning. And, and at the centre of that, and I heard the word partnership, and that's certainly been a strong 
um, component of how we've approached it here in Queensland. And we're very thankful to our colleagues in New South Wales and Tasmania and Elga and in Sika uh, in terms of the relationships we've developed um, as we move forward on this journey of reform. Um, as you can see, um, serious steps have been taken now to um, enact a national agreement around basing the NAS on HVAMs and in turn boost safety but also productivity for industry. The agreed vision for NAS is to provide a seamless national user experience. And I think it's really important that we unite behind a vision here um, because that can make a huge difference in terms of what we uh, achieve as a country. And this is really important. It also supports, as I said earlier, the ministerial agreement to reduce per access permits and provide real time um, access largely by notice, dynamic notice. Um, it will also provide the ability for road managers to provide quicker, more consistent and transparent access decisions, which I know in the past um, industry has um, pointed out that that is very frustrating. Um, and from an industry point of view, the benefit here is that they do have transparency around uh, the visible travel conditions for individual vehicles and providing them with certainty and level playing field in terms of doing business. So. Uh, thanks, Scott. That's my takeaways from that um, early part of the presentation. I'll now move on to here in Queensland, why we've um, embarked on the journey that we have, and it's largely focusing on class one vehicles to start with. So TMR's role is to facilitate heavy vehicle access that's both safe and sustainable on our network, whilst balancing the growing demands for class um, one vehicle movements around the network with what our structures principally can support. When you look at our structures, and I know we did a seminar um, previously, and I shared this information, we have over 3,100 bridges on our network, on the state control network. And these bridges range in age to, 100, to being almost 100, year old, 100 years old in some cases, to ones that are more recently constructed. And as you'd expect, they are constructed, those 3,100 bridges have been constructed to different engineering design standards over time. About half of our bridges are designed for a three axle, 33 ton truck or less. Only about 15% of our bridges or 500 odd bridges are built to the current design standard. And so we, um, we've been building new bridges at a rate, those 500 over the last 20 years, which is one every two weeks. Because whilst we're actively doing that, the heavy vehicle fleet has transformed at a much, much faster rate. So we can't necessarily um, be as responsive as we'd like. I think Sanjeev used the word gold-plated. We don't have infrastructure. We need to balance things. We have finite funds, so we need to spend the money where we have um, where, where it's available wisely. And this means that not all bridges can carry the same loads. Um, we've done an engineering assessment of all our bridges and what each one can carry and how far that can be safely sweated. So we've done that analysis now across our entire network. It's taken us some time to do that, admittedly, um, but we are in that position. But we are also professionally and legally obliged to use that information as the basis for our uh, access decisions going forward. So there is a real need for change here in Queensland. Um, so in the rest of this webinar, we'll cover about we will cover how industry and ourselves are going about, about that in a partnership sense. So we go on to the next slide. Thanks, Scott. This slide I think I've used in the past as well, which talks about the degree of overstress that class one vehicles can place on bridges. So higher the load, the harder the structure works and the more um, available capacity is used up. So at higher loads above um, what the bridge was designed for, there can be incremental permanent damage um, occurring and that's highly highly likely as you move up that, um, that graph up the line. So 65% of yield, which is the dotted or dashed black line there, is the appropriate degree of overstress to support sustainable access on the network. And this is where GML freight vehicles sit and vehicles operating under notice. Above this point, bridges start to enter varying levels of overstress, which is you know, somewhat dependent on their condition, Etc. their age and then what they've been designed for. But this is where access needs to be regularly reviewed by our structural engineers. And this is where decisions are required to be, to do a responsible balance between the risk of damage to the bridge, the benefits of increased productivity, 
but also um, the investment of limited pu public funds. Where can we sustain access um, reasonably and responsibly? And as you can, sh as shown in the, um, the the boxes, class one vehicles are currently operating in the red zone. So repeated operations in this zone have significant potential for overstressing and fatigue of our structures. As a responsible road manager, we really would like to move those frequent movements below the 65% yield point. And hopefully that you'll see through how we are approaching this, and Mandy will go through this later, that um, we can achieve that in a way that manages our risks and meets our obligations, but also um, provides industry with a workable solution that is sustainable as well for them. It's in no one's interest to have regular circumstances where we're applying restrictions to bridges. And we are seeing that and we're seeing it more frequent than we have in the past. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So here we've got um, a bridge in central Queensland um, and we're, we've been monitoring this one closely. We've been putting a lot of extra instrumentation on various bridges around the state. You might be aware, um, strain gauges, bridge cameras, bridge lasers, et cetera. This one's V Creek on the Peak Downs Highway, um, southwest of Mackay. This is the most highly trafficked route for load platforms, particularly moving mining equipment to and from Mackay for servicing. The bridge was constructed in 1968 and was designed for a 33 tonne um, three axle truck. And the video here is the kind of class one vehicles crossing the bridge and how the bridge is responding. So you can note the uh, strain gauges there on span four um, girder um, in and about the center of the plot. Um, where the micro strains are white and gray, um, that is about what the bridge was designed for. When it's yellow, that's the impact on the bridge was designed for. And when the micro strain turns orange, that is three times the impact the bridge was designed for. Uh, on the left hand box, the blue box, you can see the peaked girder strains. And for comparison with the higher mass limit road trains on this route, which produce about 120 micro strain, it's about half as much impact on the structure. So our data is showing the trend that this bridge experiences greater than 200 micro strain, twice as impactful as a HML vehicle every two days. So this bridge is working really hard, unsustainably hard, and we have a, a number of structures that are in the situation across the state, but this is one of the critical ones. So if we move on to the next slide, thanks, Scott. So now I'd like to talk about that wicked or summarise the wicked challenge that we've got here. So first of all, TMR's bridges are ageing and although we are constantly improving the network, the majority of our bridges were not designed for class one vehicles that they're uh, having to carry these in this day and age. This is um, in a time when there is an increased demand and we appreciate and we know the importance of um, the growing Queensland, particularly the mining and the energy sectors. We've seen a real uptick in the energy sector in particular. Each bridge has a finite capacity. So our current regime allows access for some class one vehicles beyond what our assessed capacity of the structures is. And this is not surprising. It's this mismatch that we've got. Um, current, the current heavy vehicle access regime was established in 1987 based on 1970s engineering. So over time, the, the um, access regime we have in place now has been evolving, um, but there also has been significant change in the vehicle vehicle um, categories and classifications um, over that time too. So the class one vehicles have evolved as well as in industry's choice of vehicle and the loading behavior. Many of the vehicles uh, operating today, including load platforms did not exist or were very rare movements in frequent trips um, when the current access regime was initially developed. Um, the other thing that comp compounds this is we don't have any visibility about what configurations are moving across our structures. Um, so consequently, our current access framework um, is not um, sustainable in terms of the engineering um, analysis that we've done. To many of these, manage these challenges and meet our legislative responsibilities, that's why we've been developing the new access regime, which we'll go into more detail in a moment, um, based on best practice engineering, but also working very closely and collaborating closely with our industry working group. So Scott, if we can go to the next slide, please. We've also um, listened to that industry working group and heard what they've said over the past year and a half to us in terms of co-designing a new access regime. This slide summarises what our industry has been telling us around their wicked challenges. Firstly, current access conditions are inconsistent throughout Queensland and not easily, easily accessed and not well understood. 
industry have reported that the permit approval process is labour intensive, intensive, cumbersome, slow and inconsistent, and that impacts business opportunities. Due to the lack of certainty and visibility of access and mass limits, industry have the inability to plan moves with confidence. So we know there's a practice of putting in multiple just-in-case permits, which doesn't help us either here in government. So industry also tells us there's a lack of transparency. The imp this impacts them getting answers quickly, and is, which is vital to their business. Because of these issues, the current access regime does not provide the heavy vehicle industry with the productivity benefits and also the level playing field across industry. So we've agreed with our industry working group that the new regime needs to fulfil the principles of consistency, timeliness, certainty, transparency, and customer focus to be successful. So now I'd like to hand over to Mandy Heldane, our program director of our class one heavy vehicle access program review and ask her to propose details of that access regime. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Dennis. So a new, as Dennis has just explained, we've got a new access regime that we've been co-designing with industry and our access regime contains four principal pillars that uphold those five principles Dennis just spoke about. It's a fully integrated regime and all four pillars are required um, to be in place um, to offer the proposed benefits that heavy vehicle industry and road managers can, can achieve. The four pillars are based on access based on network capacity of our roads and bridges, access provided by notice or a special access permit, assurance of network use to support our capacity calculations and road use data to inform our asset management and investment. So now I'll take you through each of these pillars in a bit more detail. Our first pillar is based on network capacity of our roads and bridges. So what this means is access is based on what our individual structural network capacity and then compared that against the load that's induced by your specific individual vehicle configuration. So that is our capacity of our bridges and roads to safely support the vehicle specific configuration and its load. So for every bridge, we will have a profile of what specific class one vehicle can cross that bridge safely and under what access conditions and what level of required assurance. And we'll assess each individual vehicle at the different axle groups and masses, um, and that's how we'll give access. For every road segment, we'll do similar. We'll have a maximum dimension envelope and we'll assess each individual vehicle and load dimensions against the road dimensions to give access. This is a move away from the prescriptive one size fits all mass and dimension limits that we currently have. So what we're trying to do here is to work towards consistency and sound engineering to provide individual access. Our second pillar is around sustainable access via a dynamic notice through HPEMS, which is the system you saw before, or above sustainable access through a special access permit. So aligning this with our first pillar, access under dynamic notice will be based on the assessment of each individual vehicle parameters against the capacity of each bridge and structure in Queensland. HBEMS will provide you in real time with a tailored statewide access map for your individual vehicle with the associated access conditions based on the road manager's assessment. So each time you enter your vehicle parameters, the access map will be updated and that's why it's referred to as a dynamic notice as opposed to the static notices that are currently in place. Where notice access or a viable route in HVM is not available for your vehicle configuration, that is when you'll need to apply for a special access permit through the NHVR portal. So as these vehicles don't meet the sustainable access limits provided HVMs and their load effects sit above that black dash line, above that 65% yield that was on that graph that Dennis showed earlier, their assessment and their movement conditions will, need, will be um, onerous and to ensure that we can manage the risk and that they're being appropriately managed. So to inform our engineering assessment and to make sure we're meeting our obligations around managing assets for the safety of all road users and our responsibilities under our Professional Engineers Act, we will require evidence that all options to operate sustainably under HVMs have been explored first. So that is um, having a look at alternative routes or changing your vehicle configuration, your vehicle load, and your fourth option is then to come in for that permit. It's expected though that those special access permits will be rare and infrequent and they're really reserved for special circumstances like emergencies or major infrastructure projects. This diagram, I guess the first stage is on, uh, we're focusing is on low loaders and platforms and eventually TMR will transition all of our heavy vehicles into HMs and special access permits. And this visual is to show how the current permit 
scheme for load carrying ocean will change under the new regime. So access under the current multi-state class one load carrying vehicle exemption notice up to 49 and a half ton, which is the box at the, the base of those diagrams there. Nothing changes there, that will remain unchanged. But access by a period permit and single trip permit will be replaced by individual access under the dynamic notice through HVMs or a special access permit. We expect that most of our period permit vehicles and some of the single trip permit vehicles will move across to access under HVMs. So you'll note the HVMs box has been displayed larger than the special access vehicles, a special access permit, sorry. Um, and this is deliberate because we are expecting that there'll be a larger amount of access provided through the HVMs notice than through permits. So back to our pillars, our third pillar is around the assurance of network use to support the capacity calculations. So like all road managers, we provide access to our roads and bridges based on our risk appetite, which is formed by information of network usage. So when assessing vehicles for bridge access, we, we balance the transport productivity with our asset consumption, and that's, that's the balance we have to make. And so we use different assessment load factors based on assumptions of how a vehicle will travel across a bridge. Like um, we make an assumption that the assumed vehicle mass won't be exceeded. We make an assumption that if we set a travel condition that the vehicle needs to travel down the centre of the bridge or at a slow speed, we make the assumption that it will comply with that. So confidence in the way our network is used and certainty of vehicle and load mass is what provides us with the assurance that risks are being appropriately managed and then that supports our risk-based engineering calculations. And this then allows our risk appetite to adjust for us to offer them more granulated access for vehicles under notice and to provide industry with as much productivity as we safely can. And that leads into what Dennis was talking about, of being able to sweat the asset. Um, so to ensure we're actually getting that balance right between transport productivity and asset consumption, assurance of network use will be achieved through a combination of monitoring tools. This will include mandatory vehicle telematic monitoring application, TMA, and smart onboard mass, OBM and that would be administered through Transport Certification Australia. So TMA and Smart OBM are critical tools for TMR and also for industry operators to provide a way to offer assurance around heavy vehicle access to the road network, and they can provide valuable insights into the vehicle movements and the network usage, which feeds back into our assurances and our risk appetite. We recognise that we will need to allow sufficient time for industry operators to fit telematic monitoring equipment to the OSIN vehicles. Um, we're aware that while TMR, TMA sorry, certified products are currently available, it might take 12 to 18 months to have certified smart onboard mass to be available for the hydraulic suspension systems that these vehicles have. Uh, we plan to continue our consultation with TCA and with our approved service providers around these products and the installation timings as we go along. We'll also be using our existing in-road monitoring tools that we have already, which is our way in motion devices in-road and our classifiers to monitor the mass of vehicle axle groups, our automatic number plate recognition cameras and our CCT cameras, which monitor vehicle usage, and monitor compliance of notice and permit bridge conditions such as centre line travel and slow speed over structures. And we'll achieve that through our ANPR cameras, but also bridge cameras and in-strain uh, in bridge strain gauges at key locations, um, like the video you saw earlier on Bee Creek. So really a focus around assurance of network usage and then certainty and transparency of mass will provide a level playing field for all of industry operators and that allows us then to have the confidence to be able to provide that granular access under notice. Our final pillar is around road use data to inform asset management and investment. And as Dennis said previously, class one vehicles present the highest risk of moves on our network, yet we don't have visibility of where, when, how frequently they're moving, at what mass they're actually moving across our network. So road use data is really vital for the department to facilitate heavy vehicle access in a way that's both safe and sustainable in our network, whilst still balancing the growing demands for the class one heavy vehicle movements within our existing constraints of our network and our available funding. So we'll take the data and the video analytics of the data gathered from the monitoring tools I mentioned in the previous slide, and then we'll combine this with other data sets and engineering risk review, and that will inform how our access and asset management decisions are made going forward. By better understanding what types of vehicles are moving across our bridges and at what frequency, we're able then to update things like our fatigue modelling of our bridges and our inspection and maintenance frequency, moving more to proactive maintenance rather than reactive. And this will enable us then to manage our network to allow sustainable access for all road users. So better visibility and understanding of our, how our network is being used will also enable us to plan and invest appropriately in our network for all users. 
So to understand the worth of our new regime, we commissioned an external economist to complete a cost-benefit analysis of the new regime implemented across all state-controlled roads and local government roads in Queensland. The analysis considered the financial and the economic costs and the associated benefits of the new regime compared to TMR's existing permits-based framework with engineering assessment enacted to manage risk. The industry costs and benefits were based on information that was provided from our industry working group. And this table I've shown on the screen here shows a summary of the benefit cost calculation for a low scenario and also a high scenario. The dollar values there are shown are millions and it's over a 20 year period. As you can see on the bottom line that's circled with the green circle there, the new regime provides a benefit cost ratio of between 8.62 and 36.78, which is very impressive. Uh, the greatest benefits will be in transport end users and the economy. Industry benefits outweigh road manager benefits by nine times. Um, uh, by far the biggest benefit for industry is around the avoided time delays for not needing to get a permit to move. So this, of course, then flows into less lost jobs and an even playing field. Access under HVM's notice is immediate. As you've um, seen from the demonstration from Luke and Aaron, once you have that map, you can literally get in the cab and go. Um, this then provides um, efficiencies uh, and operational flexibility. Um, this flows into um, saves between 844 million and 4 billion over a 20 year period. The dynamic notice provides on-demand access and certainty, which enables operators to be able to plan, plan their moves um, and which vehicle to use, which load combination and which routes they want to do instantly within the system. So these efficiencies and operation flexibility provide significant savings in the order of 126 million to 504 million over a 20 year period. And then the other major benefit for industry is in the administrative savings through industry operators not needing to apply and pay for a permit to move. Um, access by HVMs is free, and this is estimated to save industry between 33.7 million and 49.4 million over the 20 year period. So we recognise that some of the benefits could be slightly less if compared to the current access regime. However, we also recognise that the current access regime is not sustainable and needs to change, as Dennis has explained earlier. Road managers also benefit through saving resources, processing permits, and um, Sanjeev touched on this as well. And then also um, having the ability then to make more strategic, strategic um, management, investment, and insights based on the telematics, providing information of how the network is now being used. But then, of course, the other side of the coin then is the cost of the new regime. For industry, the main cost will be in the fitment of telematics on your vehicles. And for TMR and other road managers, the costs are associated with collecting the data to populate the HVM system and then the ongoing system and costs and the telematics monitoring costs. Um, overall, the cost benefit analysis has shown, though, that the benefits to industry and road managers far outweighs the costs and investments in telematics and data. And we have determined that an industry break-even point will occur between a few months to a couple of years, depending on the size of your business and the continual reliance on permits. Next and very importantly, I'll take you through how we envisage the new access regime will work. So as shown previously, access under HVM's notice is very simple. As one of our industry working group members described it, it's access in five minutes instead of 25 days. Um, we'll be able to access HVM through the NHVR website. It's not limited to operators like a permit is. It could be used by vehicle designers or manufacturers. It could even be load consigners, use it as a planning tool to determine how many components they need to break their load into for it to be moved sustainably under a notice. You can enter your vehicle configuration details, including your dimensions and your mass, and your telematics details for vehicle eligibility directly into HVAMS. HVAMS in Queensland will have an allowable dimension envelope of 5.4 high, 8 metres wide, and 45 metres long. This system confirms that your vehicle is eligible for notice access and issues you with a vehicle identification number for future use. So you only need to enter your dimensions in the first time. The next time you use the system, you just use your identification number, which pre-populates what you had in there last time. If you're not eligible, you, it will direct you um, to move over to ask for a special access permit. So if you're outside of that dimension envelope, for instance, it will direct you to a special access permit, which I'll explain in the next slide. Access for your vehicle is determined within the system by comparing your specific vehicle with the road manager predetermined access parameters. In a matter of seconds, the system generates and displays a statewide access map for your unique vehicle configuration with the roads and bridges displayed as unconditional, conditional or no access. You can visually see and use this information to identify a viable route for your journey and also confirm any pilot and escort requirements, any special travel conditions over bridges or any other important information like your time curfews, road closures, height clearances, some of those aspects that Luke and Aaron showed earlier. 
The map is then your legal access map and you can jump in the cab and start your journey. There will be or may be instances where the mass and dimensions of your vehicles operate under the current regime are not available under notice access. And this is a result of that mismatch between the engineering assessment and the current access regime that Dennis mentioned earlier. So for some of our bridges, the current load limits are not sustainable for repeated movement under a notice. So if you find a road or a bridge on your preferred route that's labelled with no access, with a red dot or a red line, then there's really four options for you to explore. First option would be around could you reduce your mass and amend your vehicle configuration. We see a lot of mining equipment that's moved between mines and servicing that still has tyres and trays and extra equipment on it. So is there the option of reducing that, taking it off, making that load truly indivisible so you now have a, a less load mass, which you could then put back into the system and you may then get a different answer and the red dot may disappear. The second option you could do was to look at changing your vehicle configuration. It could be that you could add additional axles. You might have an eight axle platform. You could add a, a two axle module, make that into a 10 axle platform. And you're now moving that same load, but because you're spreading it across more axles, each individual axle weighs less. So it may go from 15 tonne line to say 13 tonne line, put the vehicle in and the red dot again may, have, may not be there anymore. The third option is to have a look at alternative routes. Are you able to plan your route around those around that um, bridge or road that had the red dot or the red line? And, and um, Luke took us through that before. And then the fourth option there is if you've looked at everything else and you still can't yield kind of a journey for your particular vehicle, then it's still apply for a special access permit. But the advantage of HACEFAMS is that you will be advised of all your restricted bridges and roads quickly. So you'll be able to explore options to facilitate notice access real time within the system, even while you've actually got the customer on the phone. So the next slide I'll take you through is how we envisage that the access will be provided under a permit in the new regime. Like you do now, you still apply for your permit through the NHVR portal, nothing changes there. As these vehicles don't meet the sustainable access limits provided by HVMs, they'll be assessed for permit access. So we require a bit more information to be able to inform our engineering assessment and to make sure we're meeting our responsibilities under the Professional Engineers Act for these vehicles. We require evidence that all options have been explored to operate sustainably under HVMs. So that was those other three options I mentioned before. And then we'll also require a bit more information to verify the vehicle load and the, the vehicle you're using, tear masses and things like that, and that the telematics are fitted. Our bridges and roads on the requested route will be assessed by our engineers for your vehicle configuration and our assessment timings will be in accordance with the heavy vehicle national law timeframes like they are now. And then if access is acceptable, then you'll be approved on a requested route for your individual vehicle travel conditions and a permit duration will be based on the movement that you actually need. So this will be for an individualised vert permit. So we'll no longer be providing blanket 12 month permits. Each permit will be provided for the, the time duration you need for your particular vehicle for the load that you're actually moving. So it's moving away from a one size fits all to individualised permits. And finally, I'd like to take you through the next steps of our work program. New regime will be a significant change in the way that we do class one vehicle access and operate in Queensland's road network. And it's therefore important that we get this right for industry and road managers. So we'd really appreciate you providing us with feedback about our proposed new access regime, taking into consideration what you've heard from us today. And you can do this via an online 10 minute survey that we've published on our external web page, along with our extra program information for you to have a read. We'll email you the link of the survey post this presentation along with our email address should you have any questions. And we'll also, can also organise one on one sessions on demand if you would like to come in and talk to us about your proposed changes and what they might mean for your business. We're keen to continue to co-design this new regime with you and we would like to continue to update you as we progress along this journey. Um, that's the end of the, um, the slides and the webinar that we've got for today. And so I'd like to um, thank you for taking the time to attend and I'll hand it back to Scott. Excellent. Thank you, Mandy, and thank you to all our presenters today. Um, we have quite a lot of questions in there, but we have used up all our time today. Um, the team will continue to work through those questions. Um, we have them all there. We'll provide responses where we can for those ones we haven't had a chance to answer. Um, our information is also there on the screen for you. If you have any um, questions, please go and have a look at our website. It has a lot of information on there about the new regime. So your questions may be answered by going and having a look at our web page. Alternatively, our email address is there. Please email us if you have questions or you would like to arrange a one on one with us. As Mandy mentioned, the survey um, link will come out 
to all attendees as well some um, additional information to support that. Please do complete the survey. It's important to us that we get your feedback and we get your input. It will lead to us developing a, a suitable regime here in Queensland. So that is about it. I'd like to thank everyone for making the time to attend on a Monday morning. I would like to thank our presenters and everyone who shared information today. We hope you found it valuable. Uh, those questions that are there, we will get back to you um, as quickly as we can. So that is it. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and week. Thank you.